Well, good morning, everyone. How's the lunch? Is everything going well? You like the spot? Scott and I are always big on kind of making a splash, so we tried with this, but we are the founders of LifestyleFrisco.com. We are a multimedia, digital-only media property telling the story of who to know, where to go, and what to do in Frisco, Texas. So if you haven't, please go to LifestyleFrisco.com slash subscribe and subscribe to our twice-weekly email so that you will be in the know of everything going on here in Frisco. We are so fortunate to sponsor this event today um, with the mayor, and I want to make sure that all of you who are social, that you hashtag any pictures or activities that you do around this event, hashtag Ask Mayor Cheney, because as Ed said, th this is a unique opportunity where the mayor comes into the crowd and really wants to know what you guys are thinking. So, Scott? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott Ellis, and I have the privilege of asking the questions. Mayor Cheney, come on over. So the format, thank you. Yeah, so the format of, of today's event is sort of an ask, ask, uh, ask me anything type format. Uh, if you haven't Almost already, um, <laughs> within reason, yes. Uh, if you have not already, there is an app you can download called Slido, and uh, you don't have to sign up, you don't have to create an account, just use the hashtag Ask Mayor Cheney when it asks for the event code, and you can submit your questions, and you can upvote questions that are already asked. So if a question gets more upvotes, it'll rise up to the top. But we're going to ask uh, questions that have been submitted, and then we're also going to look for uh, feedback and comments and ideas from you guys at the same time. So please be uh, thinking about anything you would like to add to this conversation. We want it to be as interactive as possible. Jeff, is there anything you'd like to say before we kick it off? No, I just want to thank everyone for being here. What do you think of the venue? This is uh, yeah, pretty cool, huh? <laughs> just know that I can see each one of you, so if you fall asleep, I'm going to know it. Um, and we do have a mo movie ready to cue, just in case this isn't going well for me. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm excited to be here. Uh, the last few that we've done, we've presented some information, um, you know, and I really wanted this one to kind of get back to the first one, which was kind of more hearing from you, hearing your concerns, answering your questions. Um, but don't be afraid to shout out, raise your hand, and, you know, I'd rather this uh, be a dialogue versus you know me speaking for the next hour so i'm really want to have a two-way two conversation but well if you do have it. to speak for the whole hour there's a bottle of water there for you so <laughs> all right so let's go ahead and dive in and the first question that was uh, submitted and has been upvoted uh, pretty extensively i think doesn't come as a big surprise everyone would like to know what's happening with the wade park project and are we still going to get a whole foods you know i'm glad we actually have some answers to this question now this used to be on our slide when i go give presentations was literally the big elephant in the room um, where no matter where I went people would ask but what about Wade Park what is going on with the big giant hole in the ground and so um, you know the property actually went back to the lender um, so the lender has control over it and uh, they're in the process of marketing it there was quite a line out the door really um, from the who's who of the real estate community who wanted to take on that property and take on that project um, it's actually anticipated um, a likely closing um, of um, that property in December um, to um, a development company that you would all recognize. Um, I can't tell you yet who it is, um, but I think everyone would be pleased with the um, level of projects that they have, they have done. Um, it's interesting with this project as far as the big question truly is still what to do with the big giant hole. So the big giant hole was underground parking. Um, and it was designed to be an absurd number of spaces. Um, to actually finish building out that underground parking would cost almost $100 million. Um, and you wonder why that project went under. Um, but that's the thing that the due diligence is going through. And so some things that have been looking at, it actually doesn't need that much underground parking. I think it was almost like 6,000 spaces um, that was designed to go underground. I mean, it was an absurd number. Um, so to, to actually keep it as it is, I mean, they were looking at actually infilling some dirt to make it smaller. Do you just enclose the whole thing and start over? Um, but really it looks like um, a great solution is actually, um, instead of having three decks of parking, just do two, which would be plenty of parking. Uh, but you'd have really high ceilings and it'd feel like a, a great experience. Um, and so allow that project to continue. So um, they're looking at the development plans for it. Um, the second part of the question as far as whether the Whole Foods 
um, is going to go there. Um, you know, we have heard in the market that there is speculation um, that Whole Foods and what would be considered a competing brand are both interested in that property. So um, I, I do expect you will see um, a high-end grocery retailer come to that location that our residents have been wanting for, for quite a long time. So um, I think you're going to start hearing some announcements about Wade Park in early 2020. Um, it's likely that they're actually even going to rebrand the name of the project um, just to kind of give it a fresh start and, the, and a fresh outlook. Um, but I think they believe that um, that site will become the project that we all expected it would become, and we certainly believe that as well. Excellent. Does anybody have any questions or comments specific to Wade Park? Anything else you'd like to ask? That was a lot of good information. All right, I'll take that as a no. All right, let's go on to the next question. And that is uh, submitted by Anonymous. You can submit your questions anonymously. <coughs> with all the division happening in our country, what is Frisco doing to bring about <coughs> unity, with, unity within our city? And what is your favorite event which exemplifies unity? You know, I think we're pretty fortunate here in Frisco that we are a very unified city, you know, especially relative to a lot of other communities. Um, you know, and, and quite frankly, our, our council believes that the tone of that starts at the top. Um, and so, I mean, just even little things, um, we're not afraid um, to celebrate Christmas here in Frisco. Um, yeah, I mean, just, it, it, it's the little things, and I love lighting the Christmas tree in Frisco Square. I actually like lighting the menorah in Frisco Square more, because I get to use a blowtorch. <laughs> <laughs> but just those little things that we're showing, um, you know, that level of unity. Um, you know, I, I remember um, we at last year, for the first time, we celebrated Holy in a city park. Um, very, um, you know, it's a festival of colors. It's just a great celebration. And uh, we got a couple emails from residents that said, you should not be doing this in city-owned property. This is a cultural event. And, you know, use some um, colorful language, I would say. Um, and, you know, city staff was kind of scrambling with that, saying, well, gosh, maybe this was a bad idea. And, you know, thankful for the leadership of council, you know, we decided, you know, as a community that, no, we want to support these types of events. And if a couple people are going to complain, they can be the vocal minority and then go complain to the wall, quite frankly. Um, and, you know, we had hundreds of people show up. Yeah, I mean, and it wasn't just Indians that showed up to that event. Um, my favorite event, I think, was asked is actually uh, the MLK celebration um, that's done every year. Um, if you've never been to one of those, it's incredible. Um, so Angelia puts that, puts that on. I'll, I'm sure she'll give a plug for it here shortly. It's coming up here next month. Um, but it's actually our high school students that do um, or an oration contest where they have to memorize a speech. And it, I mean, it's just the most uplifting event of the year. Um, these kids are extraordinary. Um, and I love going to it every single year. Um, and so that's a big part of it, is just showing your willingness to celebrate, you know, different ethnicities, different beliefs, um, and really getting to know each other. Um, we still have a lot of work to do as a community. Um, and here recently, um, we actually have formed a diversity task force, which will be rolling out in 2020, which is going to be representatives from this community, from all religions and backgrounds that are really coming together to advise me and council as far as how we can even be better as a community. Um, and so it's some, something that we want to continue to support. Um, it's important for me as mayor that um, everyone who lives in this community feels like they're welcome in this community. And I hope and I know that the people that live here feel the same way. Very good. So I'd be curious to know if anybody out there, are there other cultural events, things that are happening uh, in that space that uh, you might want to give a shout out to? Even if you're the event organizer, that's fine. I'd love to hear more about those. Are there other events that we should be looking out for? Please.
Yeah, and just to tell you a little bit about the event, so two years ago at the event, my, my main man, Lucius, um, who was a member of my mayor's youth council, one of the leadership team on my mayor's youth council, he actually, I think, got second place and then ended up winning $5,000, or I believe, as a scholar, $3,000 as a scholarship. Um, he followed in my footsteps to go to the University of Texas because he wants to be just like me. I, I want to think that, but that's really not the case. Um, and I still follow him on social media. Well, he got a full ride to UT. And so last year, he sent a video in to surprise all the kids there um, that he was actually donating his scholarship back to the kids. And so we were able to re-gift it. Um, so it just tells you about Lucius and the ca caliber of kids that are going through this program. It was a fantastic event. We were there for that. That was a special night. And Angelia, is there a date already set? All right, January 17th at Verona Villa. Okay. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, Shane Gilmore asks, what keeps you up at night regarding Frisco? That's a good question. Um, oh, goodness. Depends on the night. Um, <laughs> some nights it's council meetings, like last night. I think we didn't end up till uh, close to midnight, I think, last night, 1130. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, when we look at Frisco and I hear the but for from our residents, you know, most people say I love everything about living in this community but for the traffic. Um, that's the biggest concern that, you know, we have, you know, just with the rapid growth, trying to keep it, you know, on top of that. Um, you know, m making sure that we create an identity here and we're staying on track with that, um, you know, is important. Um, I mean, we have a lot of big projects. I mean, we'll talk about a, a lot of the successes, you know, and I always kind of move on to, okay, how could we have done that better? Um, what are we missing? Um, you know, I think one big thing, or one of the biggest things that it's on my radar still is the Performing Arts Center, trying to get that done. Um, that's a tough one, um, but it's had has more momentum now than it has ever had, um, and I think that we get that to the finish line here in 2020. Um, so I'm really excited, you know, about that project. And then I'm sure we'll, somebody will ask me about Grand Park. Um, I've told the story many times. No jumping ahead, Jeff. That is our <laughs> next question. Is that on there? Okay. Go ahead. Um, well, I'll set that one up that, um, you know, I first ran for city council in 2007 when I was first elected. And what motivated me to want to run was reading an article about the idea of Grand Park. Um, and I wanted to work on that project and here we are 12 years later and it still hasn't started. So um, that's a big frustration is the urban legend of the city, I think. Um, but I'm anxious to get that one going. So let's just go ahead and segue into talking a little bit more about Grand Park. Um, first of all, do you guys have any questions specific to Grand Park? How many of you actually have heard about the project and know and a whole bunch of you have not as well? Okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about Grand Park? and then maybe where things are and what we should be looking forward to. How many of you have actually seen a rendering of what Grand Park is supposed to be? So a few of you. So get that image out of your head because that's not what it's going to be. <laughs> that is going in the trash and we are going to start over from scratch um, and reimagining what that park is going to be and part of the reason is, is that um, the park is quite a bit bigger than it used to be. So the original contemplated park was 300 acres. Um, and once we acquired the Exide property, we have another 300 acres on the east side of the tollway now. And so now the vision is to create a 600 acre park. So it's Grand Park East and West. Um, and it's gonna have a trail system that we've acquired that goes all the way to Lake Louisville, connects through the central part of Tech, um, Frisco, up through the Exide property and connects all the way to the rail district downtown. So there's going to be all interconnectivity between there. Um, the big hang-up has been the um, Corps of Engineers and the envisioned lake that's going in there. Even that lake concept, we're rethinking now as far as what is the best strategy for that park. You know, you see these kind of grand um, regional and national parks. Um, they're really not designed like Grand Park is, you know, as far as when you look at that rendering where it's just kind of this big open sea of grass, you know, kind of the world-class parks are, are designed more with um, different rooms. You know, you go to a Clive Warren Park or you go to a Millennium Park in Chicago or, um, you know, I don't know, Bobby Roberti's here. He sent me one that's in that we're going to go take a look at 
um, in Oklahoma, the gathering place. You know, those are the types of um, parks that we're looking at where you're always wanting to know kind of what's around that next corner, what's that different experience, and so you interact with the park in different ways where we may have 20 or so different kind of pocket little parks that are making up this big larger concept. So we're really um, excited about that. Um, and, um, you know, we're actually in the throes of talking about that right now. I really wish I could talk about it. And, you know, maybe if you keep asking me, I'll give you a little bit of tidbits of how we're going to solve this lake problem. Um, but again, I think um, 2020 is the year that we really start talking publicly about Grand Park and starting to move forward on it. Finally. Glad to hear that. Do you guys have any specific questions on Grand Park? Anyone? I would say with all the projects that Frisco has done, um, when we look back here in 15, 20 years, I think Grand Park will be the project we're most known for. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One, if you can tell us, how big is the lake that's going to be a part of that proposed to be? You're going to keep diving there. So. This will be my only lake question, I promise. Um, you know, I'm really rethinking that lake, to be honest, um, as far as how it's designed and how it's used. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm starting to lean towards there's a better concept for that uh, and I'll just kind of throw that out there as I'm probably already saying too much but uh, I actually I'd love to hear feedback why not let's do it um, so kind of how I'm re-envisioning um, this should this is probably a mistake um, Perhaps we can talk about trails, <laughs> bike trails, hiking trails that might be a part of the park. Let's just and say I'm more lakes? excited about Grand Park than I've, than I've ever been. And the lake concept, I really want it to be an active lake. I don't want it to be something that you just look at and that you just walk around, that uh, you actually use and interact with it, um, that you can swim in it, that we can have triathlons in it, that you could paddleboard in it, that you could do all kinds of things, that your, your kids could run out and splash and play in it. Um, and how it's currently envisioned, that's not what it is. It's a park that, I mean, it's a lake that you look at and it's very difficult to get around. I mean, it's contemplated to be this huge, massive, dirty lake. I mean, it's a Texas lake and that is not my dream of Grand Park. I want, when you to go to Grand Park, you want to see people running around it, swimming in it, paddle boarding in it, rowing in it, all those kinds of things. And it's really an active part of um, the community. And so, um, we think we've found a really good way to solve that, but we're still in negotiations. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Have you ever worked with the Corps of Engineers? <laughs> Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated because it is an on-channel um, creek, so it impacts water rights with the city of Dallas because it flows into Lake Louisville, and so um, there's a lot of complicated issues. Um, that's another challenging factor because, you know, the initial bid we got back was, you know, they wanted us to mitigate all the trees around the lake. Well, that's part of the beauty of that property is the trees, um, and clearing those trees would, would really devalue that park and then we'd have to go replant them somewhere else you know and that initial um, bill was something like a hundred million dollars and we're like well that doesn't sound like a good idea um, and so you know that's kind of made us take a step back and you know I, and I think actually it's been a good thing you know when I look at it now and I see kind of what this park can now become you know I'm glad it's taken 10 years because if we would have built this lake five years ago I think it honestly would have been a lesser park than, than what we're thinking about today. Oh, thank you for bringing it up. Connectivity with the Railroad Museum. So um, that's an, another exciting part of this park and having these districts because um, the new library, where that's going, will actually, well, our library will be the library at Grand Park. It will be an asset of this park where they have gathering places and rooftop terraces. Um, our museum district is part of Grand Park. Um, the railroad museum, the um, video game, art, you know, museum, 
you know, so all those are elements of this park. We're looking at an arboretum maybe where the old Exide property used to be. And so just kind of thinking about it, if you have visitors coming or you are a visitor and you say, you can kind of get your map of Grand Park and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to spend a whole day here. What all can I do? And go visit Jeff's Lake. I can go <laughs> rent, a, <laughs> rent a bike and ride to Lake Louisville if I want to. I can go to the arboretum. I can go to the museum district. You know, I can spend a couple of days just visiting this park. I mean, that's why I say, that's why I get so excited about it. Um, when it's all said and done, you know, why I think this would be what Frisco's, you know, best known for. I mean, it's a park that's going to be built over decades and generations and phases. Um, but when you look at, you know, 600 acres and the scale of it, which will have some commercial um, components to it. So I kind of envision like a boardwalk along the lake where you can, you know, shopping and you have restaurants kind of spilling out, patios kind of spilling out, overlooking the water and, the, and those features. Um, so there'll be those elements associated with it, you know, as well, where you could, I mean, you can spend a whole weekend, you know, and people who live here obviously would enjoy it every day. Awesome. Sounds like an awesome project. So, okay. If there are no more questions on that one, we'll move on. We'll move on anyways. Uh, anonymous, another anonymous question submitted says, what is Frisco doing to support entrepreneurs and small businesses? Um, who's, a, who's a small business here or an entrepreneur? Yeah, a lot of us. Um, so I'm one. And um, so I, I know it's important for the community, uh, for the city to do everything we can to support. I mean, there are, <coughs> you know, challenges is, um, you know, there's only so much that government can do, right? You know, we have to rely on a lot of other different entities um, to fill the needs. Obviously, the chamber, I know Tony's here somewhere. Tony, um, you know, the chamber feels a big part of that from the city's perspective um, as far as providing that support. And we like to support them however, you know, we can do it for those endeavors. Um, but we're trying other things. I mean, the big purpose of getting the University of North Texas to Frisco, um, one of those was um, that very fact that they were going to be here to support our entrepreneurs and what's happening with Inspire Park and Inspire Frisco um, is really starting to take off. Um, you know, all the elements are in place now for an entrepreneur to get started um, from a support structure, um, to, you know, to coaching, to having access to employees and other things, to the biggest piece, quite frankly, that we were missing is having access to capital, which is hard in this region. A lot of the capital flows to the coasts, um, and we're trying to have, you know, you know, Central Texas and specifically Frisco to be a hotbed for that, you know, and so we're recruiting people people like Capital Factory to come here, they're going to have a presence here, um, to really put all those elements in place. And it's really being driven by the University of North Texas. Um, you know, I saw Scott Johnson back there. Um, I think that's Scott. He's way back there. Yeah, hey, Scott. Um, so Scott was a council member with me for a long time. And, you know, we used to have an incubator in town um, called Intech. And Intech was like the dirty little secret that nobody wanted to talk about because it just bled money. And so that was the government's attempt to try to do an incubator. Um, and that's what that looks like. And him and I would be the ones that were kind of shouting from the rooftops every single year saying, hey, we need to stop doing this, that we're wasting money on this, that we're not good at it, that we need to go find a partner and support them and let them do it because they know what they're doing. And it just kind of went on and on and on every single year. Um, and then, you know, finally, um, you know, that was kind of one of the, the first missions I had when I was elected was to, you know, to finally cut that off. And, you know, thankfully, we were able to sell that building, the old Intec building. It was debt that our EDC had that was wasting a lot of our EDC staff's time. Um, you know, we were trying to be in the property management business by owning Park 45. Um, so, you know, I use a phrase that it's really easy to be busy. It's hard to be productive. And... So those were activities that were keeping our EDC very busy, but very unproductive. Um, and so we got rid of it all. And so UNT took over Intec, the building. They know what they're doing. They actually hire professors that come in and are running this, and they are just killing it now. Um, and that's really starting to take off. You're going to hear more and more about that over the, the coming years. Um, Park 45. You know, we we're, again, trying to be property managers. We actually sold that to Blue Star, the Dallas Cowboys, as part of a negotiation for them to bring their merchandising center um, here to Frisco. They're actually going to take that up to Prosper. And I said, no, you're not going to Prosper. Keep that here. Um, and now they're basically leasing out the whole space, and that's building out right before our eyes. And so, <laughs> Dolly. Um, <laughs> um, so, 
you know, those those are some things. Um, you know, I hear feedback. I mean, I'd love to hear feedback from you all, from the people who raise their hand as far as small businesses, as, as far as things that we can do better um, to try to help support support y'all's efforts if there's any comments. Don't be shy. Or are y'all all asleep now? <laughs> or they're busy eating. That food looks pretty good from up here. Good. Okay. Um, all right, then. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down a couple of questions just for the sake of having a little fun. Somebody would like to know, what is your favorite yoga pose? It was that anonymous? Yeah, it was an anonymous question. As well, yes. <laughs> um, so um, I love to do yoga. I'm not afraid to admit that. So I, I enjoy it. Although the yoga I do, I dare anyone who's going to laugh to come try it um, because it's, um, it's really challenging. It's kind of more like CrossFit weightlifting in a 110-degree room um, with some yoga mixed into it. Uh, but I, I'm a big believer in it. In fact, we've been getting our kids to start doing it. They're all, they're all athletes. I think every athlete should be doing it. Um, in fact, the studio I go to here in Eldorado, Hot Body, they, um, we have multiple Cowboys players that are in there every single week, you know, and so I think more and more athletes are starting to get into it. Um, you know, as far as my favorite pose, you know, one thing that I never thought I'd ever be able to do in my life is a handstand. And believe it or not, this old man can do a handstand. <laughs> I'm not going to do it right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good answer, though. Good answer, though. Okay, next question. Uh, Brittany Kohlberg asked, as Frisco continues to develop, how do you envision different sectors of the city evolving and taking on their own different characters? She's been listening to me. I'm so proud of you, Brittany. Uh, but that is something I love talking about because, you know, a lot of cities, you know, you go to a city and no matter where you go, it's all the same. And that's not what we want here in Frisco. I mean, we want everything to have its unique and distinct identity. So if you live here, you're visiting here, you want to experience Frisco in a different way, you can any night of the week. And so kind of what you're seeing right now, you know, Stonebriar, you can already start seeing that take shape between Stonebriar, Hall Park, you know, we hope the Performing Arts Center goes there and the star and the blend of arts and sports there and it's, you know, contemporary feel, um, upscale feel, you know, everyone can kind of see and, and feel what that's going to be like. Um, the center part of our city is obviously going to be highlighted by Grand Park and that experience and the rail district and interacting with that where it's that more eclectic feel. Um, we're trying to get a brew pub to come here to Frisco, um, you know, locate downtown. So those types of elements, you know, you already have the food truck park, but more of that kind of feel and kind of the core of our city. And then, of course, up north where we are right now, um, you know, y'all got to see it driving out here a little bit. When you, when you drive back into town, just look right and left and look at the terrain and the elevation changes on this property that's out here. And, and most people drive, drive this and don't even pay attention. It's unbelievable. It's, it's property that doesn't exist anywhere else in North Texas um, with that kind of elevation changes. And that's why it was so attractive for the PGA of America. And so with this area is going to be really feel like is and what we're going to preserve is those view corridors you know that no matter where you are whether it's in an office building or it's in a restaurant that you're going to be able to look out and you know see obviously this asset of the golf course be able to see I mean you'll be able to see all the way across town um, when we did the groundbreaking for the PGA I mean you kind of you stood up on the ridge you know where the clubhouse is going to be you know and it was really kind of awe-inspiring we were like oh my gosh I can see Lake Louisville from here you know you can see that far you know, and you can see across the course. Um, the course itself, just to kind of paint a, a visual, it, it's essentially going to be designed like a bowl. And so the, the holes are down in the bottom of the bowl, and meander through there and kind of work up and down the ridge. Um, but then all the commercial properties like on the edge of the bowl. And so normally if you go to a golf course and you're sitting in the clubhouse, you can look out and you can see a hole. You know, you can see the 18th hole, maybe the first hole. Um, here what's different about this property is you can look out and you can see the entire course. Um, I mean you just look out over it. I mean and so it's going to be really really um, incredible. And then when you look at kind of East Frisco, you know Brinkman Ranch I think is really an opportunity for us when that starts getting master planned to really create something unique and different you know there as well to get people driving east and west. Um, and quite frankly part of you know when people say how do you solve traffic, um, you know part of it is we need to give people in Frisco a reason to drive north. You know, right now everything flows south. If you're going to go to work, you're going to dinner, you're going to go to shop. A lot of our traffic is people that live north of us driving through Frisco to get to Stonebriar Mall, to the Star, Legacy West. Um, you know, 
why a project like this is so important is now if someone's going to go to a movie, they're going to stop here. And they're not going to continue to drive through Frisco to go to Frisco Square or Stone Bar Mall. They're going to come watch a movie here. Well, we need to get more up here, you know, to help um, kind of disperse that traffic. Good. Any follow-on comments or questions? No? Okay. Next question, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but Karen asks, what's keeping us from having a brewery? Um, honestly, right now, um, our ordinances don't allow it. And so we're going through and um, changing our ordinances so we can allow it, um, literally as we speak. And, and we're actually actively um, recruiting. There's a few breweries in the market right now that are very interested in coming to Frisco. Um, and so, um, you know, it, part of it was um, them asking, you know, would we be accepted? You know, they know that we'd have to change our ordinances. And now that they know that, you know, we're doing that in the process of it, but we want that type of establishment that, um, you know, I think there's a few that are pretty excited about it. Um, I think the type that we would be interested in is one that had more of an event feel to it, like maybe an event hall where they could have functions and those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, you do have to solve for trucks and deliveries and those kinds of things that, that we're working through. How many of y'all would actually go to a, a brew house? Yeah, I figured this crowd would be pretty good. <laughs> So for, for changing those ordinances, Jeff, is that something that will that we'll, we have a vote on that at some point, or is that something that city council can do? Yeah, we'll, we'll do that, and so there'll be citizen input, um, you know, on that. You know, it's really interesting that you, as long as I've been doing it, the, um, the history of alcohol in Frisco. <laughs> so I remember back in 2007, I think it was, I'd maybe been on council for two to three months. I think, Tony, you were still on council, right? Um, and the late night ordinance came up, you know, where you could start selling beer and alcohol a after midnight. Oh my gosh. Um, and I voted to support that and it passed, I think it passed 4-3, it was close. Um, and the citizens were outraged. Um, they wanted to throw me and Tony out of office. Um, thankfully, t Tony was term limited, so he didn't care as much as I did. Um, and then the voters actually overturned it. They had a petition to actually overturn what we voted. It went to a vote, and then they won. And so it overturned our ordinance. That was really eye-opening for a rookie council member. You know, I learned from that, saying, oh my gosh, um, you know, something that I just voted on got petitioned and overturned. And then I guess um, five or six y years later, I guess then it was socially acceptable to drink after midnight. Um, and it came back before the voters and you know, then it passed again. Um, and so we've been evolving as a community, certainly. Um, and you know, now, you know, if we were to brought up the concept of a brew pub in 2007, there would have been outrage, moral outrage, you know, and now I bring it, I don't even have any concern about it. Um, if you're morally outraged, you can tell me after. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's interesting to see the history of alcohol. Um, the, the things that get people most excited in Frisco is if there's a vote on alcohol or pets. <laughs> so we'll talk about the dog park one day, that story. Is there something you'd like to tell us about the dog park since you brought it up? Who has a dog? I do. I have two dogs. Who's, who's actually been to our dog park? Our dog park is amazing. And it's a hidden secret that a lot of people don't know about. Um, but that again was, um, that was actually, believe it or not, probably one of the most controversial issues I ever dealt with on city council was our dog park. Because you have people like me that have a dog and people like you that and love their dogs and want to be able to go to a park with their dog. And then you have the people over here that says, why are you spending taxpayer money on a park for dogs? And then these people get mad and say, it's not a park for dogs, it's a park for people with dogs. And it would just go back and forth and back and <laughs> forth. Um, but the reality of it is, is having niche parks is important. You know, every park has to be different. And the dog park actually gets people out to parks that may otherwise never go to a park. And so finally, there was actually a citizen group that formed called FriscoDogPark.org. <laughs> and for years, they campaigned to get this dog park. 
And finally, they got so frustrated with us that there's a water tower at um, BF Phillips Park. That's kind of off by itself, and there's some green space around it, and it's, it's kind of an odd space. Uh, but they said, since you're never going to build our dog park, um, can you just fence this area off and let us use it for our dogs? Came before council and voted, um, and I voted against it. And they were just spitting mad. And I actually remember what I said that night. I said, if we build this temporary dog park, it will be your permanent dog park. And um, so that's why I voted against it. And then sure enough, a year later, we found this piece of property where it is now, which was the perfect piece of property because it was really unusable for anything else. It wasn't near residential. Um, and we built just an incredible dog park that now the community's proud of and it's a long version of a story that you know that's something that's always kind of sat with me which is you know in Frisco it's important for us to do things once and do them right so for those that have dogs but haven't been to the park yet where is it located it's on fourth army right next to Bia Phillips Park so just north of um, Lebanon okay very good power to the puppies okay next question uh, another anonymous uh, question. What is the status of any development plans for Brinkman Ranch? That's a good question. Um, you know, there's actually, in fact, you'll probably see it um, in the news. There's, there is a parcel that's being sold currently, um, which quite frankly is a little bit of a disappointment that it's not being master planned um, to a home builder to build some residential properties. Um, so we're trying to push for the whole development to be master planned and not parceled out. The long kind of story of Brinkman Ranch was it had been kind of saved for his son Bo to be his, his project. Um, you know, Bo's a really bright kid, um, graduated with honors um, from business school. Um, you know, and I know they were starting to look at it, but um, we haven't seen any other plans from them. It's actually on my list, quite frankly, the have a sit down with them to see you know how their visions changed for it I know you know PNZ and City Council um, we want to really see them take a thoughtful approach to that piece of property it's really a unique opportunity most cities don't get and we get it over and over again which is when you have one landowner have such a large piece of property where you do have that opportunity where you can master plan it versus having 100 acre 300 acre 200 acre tracks that you're trying to make sense cohesively um, and so we're going to be pushing them hard to make sure they do that. Any questions or comments on the Brinkman uh, property? Rob, anything you want to add to that? We got some PNZ people here. <laughs> 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 if Fair I get enough. anything wrong, let me know. So George asks, Jeff, are you running for re-election as mayor? Um, yes, I am. So May 2020. Thank you. Looking forward. Thanks for to the that. plug, George. Yep. Okay, and Anonymous, is SWAT in the room by chance? I, I think this is a fashion question. It says, uh, who are you wearing? <coughs> oh boy, this is awkward. Um, I think this is a jacket from SWAT. That's probably why he asked me. Um, be Jay Hilburn. So my wife bought me these shoes. So she's from Nordstrom, so those are Nordstrom's original. So, um, And um, actually these pants I um, got from Alan Alexander. So I think I'm, just like a politician, I think I'm pretty much wearing everyone in Frisco today. <laughs> <laughs> what about the socks? You're kind of becoming known for that. Um, I think that is an online special from my wife. So Very good. for Christmas one year, she bought me like 200 pair of socks, I think. And Nordstrom's, okay. I stand corrected. <laughs> Chances are anything I wear is either from Nordstrom's or online. Fair enough. If you have any other fashion questions, you can ask Jeff after the meeting. Uh, let's go. Brad Elledge says, has George, George Purefoy indicates how much longer the city will be blessed with his leadership? You know, George is now um, hitting year 33 as the city manager for Frisco. And, uh, so interesting story that some of you may know, but many of you probably don't, is that the job that George left to take the job for City of Frisco was he used to be the city manager of a town called Columbus in Texas, not Ohio. Small little town, kind of outside of Houston. Just happens to be where my wife grew up. 
And so George actually knew Dana when she was a kid and was best friends with Dana's parents, um, you know, over 30 years ago. Um, and they still come up and visit and um, see George and Deborah. Um, but at the time, Columbus was 4,000 people. And Frisco was 3,000 people. And so everyone was saying, George, why are you leaving the great job of Columbus to go to a smaller town? That doesn't make any sense. Um, of course, George you know, had the vision. He saw exactly where the toll was going to go. He knew where Preston Road was going to go, looked at the map and said, you know, I mean, for someone to say I'm going to take this job because I know 20 years from now it's going to be something really special is, is someone with, with clear vision. Um, so, of course, today Frisco will hit 200,000 people this year. And Columbus, I think, is at, what, 4,100? Maybe. They may even be smaller now. Um, and so, um, y you know, George, he still loves the job. Um, and he has indicated um, to us a few times over the years that, you know, Deborah was pushing him to, to retire. Um, and, you know, I think his mindset has shifted a little bit where, um, you know, as long as he's still passionate about it, you know, and as long as, you know, has exciting projects to work on, um, you know, he's going to continue to want to do it. So I don't think we see him leaving um, anytime soon. From my perspective, um, it's his job until he doesn't want it anymore. And, you know, quite honestly, there's so much intellectual knowledge there that even when he does decide to retire, um, we'll actually probably work out some kind of consulting agreement with him where he can continue to be part of special projects for the city. And this is the type of person George is. And so George, over 33 years, um, rarely takes vacation. So he, one day we're doing lunch, he did the math for me. He goes, you know, I think I have um, a few years of accumulated vacation. <laughs> and so we were kind of talking about transition plans and those kinds of things. I said, well, and I asked him, I said, hey, George, you know, when you do decide you want to retire, would you be interested in a consulting agreement? Help us with things like Grand Park or bigger projects or, you know, the stuff that still makes you excited. And he's like, yeah, would you, would you consider maybe just paying me out like six months of that vacation and then I'll just keep working on it. And we were just like, you know, that's, that's George for you. Um, you know, so, you know, I actually gave this, these comments when we did the groundbreaking for the PGA because the PGA project, you know, now that we're done with it and you look back, I mean, that was the hardest project we've ever done um, for all of us, you know, you know, just so complicated with all the partners. Um, just kind of where it went from an idea to what it ended up being at the finish line and everything that had to happen along the way and it was like whack-a-mole you know you thought you had it figured out and then another head pops up that you got to whack and um, all the way to the last day literally and so when we got towards the end you know I was having lunch with George we we do every few weeks and I said George I just want to apologize that this one has been so hard he literally it was Essentially, the only thing he worked on the entire year was just focus on getting PGA to the finish line, get it to the finish line. And, you know, I was like, I'm sorry. And, you know, he looked at me and said, these are th this is why I still work, is these kinds of projects that are really hard, that are difficult. If it were easy, then I probably would have retired. And, you know, what, what do you got for me next, basically? Very good. Okay, next question. This is, a, this is an interesting one, uh, also submitted anonymously. What is Frisco doing proactively to deal with the issues of homeless, homelessness and human trafficking that seem to plague cities as they grow? You know, we actually have, um, in fact, we celebrated that Tuesday night um, with the proclamation. Um, and we have um, a lot of organizations, you know, that help with that. Um, Step Up Frisco is an organization that Ann Harris founded that's, um, you know, working with the Samaritan Inn and others, um, you know, in local churches to help with that. You know, quite frankly, government can't solve everything. I mean, as much as we want to, and but we have to rely on a lot of our social service agencies to, to really help with that. And a lot of the people who are raising their hand, how do I help, you know, the churches and pastors and those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, we're, we're very much aware of that. Um, and there is an issue in Frisco. I mean, people just think that Frisco is, you know, the shiny city on the hill and everyone's affluent and we don't have to deal with those kinds of issues, but it, it's real and, and we have to deal with it. And we have to deal with it at the teenage level and the school level. 
Um, you know, we do have homeless uh, people here in Frisco, and so our police department are monitoring them. Um, and like you said, as you continue to grow, those kind of quote-unquote big city problems will become more and more, you know, persistent. And so that's why putting some of that infrastructure in now, um, you know, is really helping. And so we have some great organizations here in Frisco from Frisco Family Services, the Samaritan Inn, and others um, that really help us <coughs> kind of support the mission of supporting the needs of, of our residents. Okay, very good. Any other comments on that one? I would like to just give a quick plug. There's also a, a charity based here, a, a nonprofit called Treasured Vessels that works with the, the human trafficking with children uh, aspect of that as well. Not something you would think of in Frisco, but it can certainly affect us here. So we're glad to have so many good organizations that are focused on those problems. Treasured vessels. Okay, I hope I pronounce this correct. Ram Maji, why are restaurants shutting down in Frisco like Zaytania? Is, is it high tax or unable to attract customers, especially with a celebrity chef. Y'all need to eat out more. Um, I mean, the, the honest reality of, of, you know, any type of market condition, you know, is you're going to have some businesses survive and some that don't. Um, you know, and we want to try to put um, every business in the right op opportunities to succeed. Um, and so part of that is being very strategic in, in how you develop properties. Um, you know, I mean, I know we talk a lot about density. I'm surprised that question hasn't come up yet today. Now that I said it, it will. Um, but, I mean, a big part of it is how do you plan out these developments and create 18-hour districts so these types of restaurants can survive? You know, where you have the star that has access to a lunch crowd because there's office there, or they have residential components, and so they have built-in customers there. Um, or people are shopping and staying to dine and those kinds of things, you know, and that's how you create environments where a restaurant can succeed. They're not all going to succeed, um, quite honestly. Sometimes it's a concept that, you know, just isn't a good concept. It's not good service. It's not good food. It's, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, rents are high here in Frisco. I mean, we, we do hear that, um, you know, certainly. Um, but also there's a lot of opportunity here in Frisco. Um, you know, as well, because of the demographics that, you know, that are here. Um, I know um, um, my man, uh, is he here from Jersey Mike's? Um, Steve? He used to come and we would chat about it all the time and, you know, he would give me a hard time. He said, you know, I can't get any teenagers in Frisco that would come make a sandwich for $6 an hour, whatever minimum wage is, um, because they're all busy with activities or, you know, they don't need the money or, what extra, you know, all those kinds of things. And so I have to pay more for that type of service. Um, and he says, you know, but I see the other side of it too, which is when I open a store in Frisco, I have so much more opportunity. Um, and better customers and clientele and those kinds of things. And so um, it is definitely, you know, a balance. Um, Zatina, um, quite frankly, um, is a restaurant I never went to. So good, bad, or different, I just, there's so, there's so many options, I never tried that one. Um, but I heard it had a lot of success. Now, as far as the celebrity chef, um, you know, I didn't even know that until recently. And so... You know, quite honestly, you know, I look at that and say, if that was a big selling proposition for your restaurant, um, and the mayor didn't know that, you know, then probably wasn't being marketed or used maybe as well as it should. So, um, you know, we're trying to support them all we can. I mean, you look at, you know, Liberty Burger went under, and in the same location, Wahlburgers comes in, and now Wahlburgers is full. Um, but part of it will grow too, and there will be natural attrition. Um, you look at downtown Frisco. Downtown Frisco used to be kind of rotating, you know, restaurants coming in and out, you know, and now they're thriving. People that are down there that kind of stuck it out, you know, are now starting to thrive and the foot traffic's coming down there. Um, you know, so, you know, I think we'll, we'll continue to see some of that natural attrition, but new, new and exciting concepts come in. What are we missing? What restaurants are we missing that we don't have? Torchies is like number one on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Pakistani food. Yes, we went and had some in Plano. It's very good. What was that? Wawa. Where's a Wawa? Northeast. Oh, you Northeasterners. <laughs> what, el what else do you think we... I know Trader Joe's is just about to say that. Um, 
Central Market HUV. What's the one I keep calling on? I'm just, um, yeah. It's escaping me now. I've called their broker like 10 times. One open in Addison. They come to me. It's Mexican food. What was that? Lupe Tortillas. That's it. Um, so once Lupe Tortilla um, finally opens in Frisco, I can officially retire. That's <laughs> no, that's good. Next question. How are we using technology to solve for traffic congestion? You know, so we get asked a, a lot about rail and mass transit and why doesn't Frisco have it. I'll kind of start with that, which is, um, you know, I'll say it out loud. I, I consider um, DART to be a Ponzi scheme. Um, that even if Frisco joined DART, that we would have to wait for like five cities behind us to join before we would ever get service. You know, and essentially you contribute your 1% of your sales tax. Um, please don't tweet, I called DART a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> 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 um, but um, we use it for our economic development and our community development corporations to fund bringing jobs here, to bringing venues here. Um, it's been just such an incredible tool for us and a much better use of our sales tax dollars. And quite frankly, how we are going to solve transportation in the future is not going to be investing in 100-year-old technology. Um, so how people get around over the next decade is going to change. You know, I've said it many times that transportation and mobility is going to change more over the next 10 years than it's changed over the last 50. Um, and it's coming. And, and some of you don't realize it's slowly happening. You know, I mean, just take a small example. Like, um, if you look back, you know, six or seven years ago, I would have never called a cab to go to a concert at Toyota Stadium. But now using Uber is second nature for everybody, right? Everybody uses it. You know, you can go out to dinner, you're going to call an Uber, you know, if you're going to, you know, those kinds of things. And so it's slowly changing your patterns and your acceptance. Well, that's going to become like a hockey stick, you know, as far as as you start privatizing these services. So rather than using DART for some of our public transportation that we already have, which is for um, the elderly and disabled, we actually went with DCTA. And they're being really innovative in their approach to this, which they're actually using. They're not um, buying their own assets. They're using private companies like Uber and Lyft. And so we used to have a contract just to provide service for our elderly and disabled. And it was costing us almost $50 a trip. Just, but we felt like, you know, as a social conscious, as a city, we have to provide this to fill this need in our community. It's $50 a trip. And that's just the cost of doing business. Well, we went out and worked with DCTA and they use Uber and Lyft in employing our, our citizens. Um, and that trip charge is now down to like $7, um, just going with the private sector. So those are just kind of small, incremental, but you're going to really start seeing that evolve and change. I mean, there will be a time. I firmly believe our grandchildren will never drive a car. I really believe that, that autonomous automobiles coming in play. I mean, even if you look at teenagers right now, how many have teenage 16 year olds that like didn't want their license i mean you know we made art zach get his and our mason will want it the, the day he turns 16 but i hear that story over and over again it's like oh he's 17 doesn't care doesn't want it um you know and so there will be we'll slowly evolve where i see in five or six years a lot of families will go down to one car you know and and then they'll start using private for their other or you or you look at ford and they say um they don't view themselves as a car selling company anymore they look at their future as being a provider of mobility service because they think they're going to have to start getting into that business where people aren't going to own a car. You may own a share of a car, you know, that kind of picks you up when you need to go, go somewhere. Um, so all those things are going to evolve and change, and we're trying to be on the leading edge of that. Um, so just to give you a few examples, like we're rethinking even how we do our commercial properties. So, you know, tip, a traditional office park, you have an office tower, you have your structured parking garage next to it. Well... 10, 15 years from now, you're not going to need all that structured parking anymore. So you're going to have all of these office parks with these structured parkings that are empty. So then what do you do with it? So what we're starting to do with our buildings is we're starting to podium park them. So what that means is the first four or five floors of the office building may be 
your structured parking, and then the office is on top of that. That's how Dr. Pepper Keurig is building their office building. Well, as those needs change, all of a sudden they're designed so floor five, you don't need that much parking anymore. We can repurpose that to office, and then floor four, and then three, and two. And eventually the whole building can be office and you don't even have the structured parking anymore. How you line it with where the cars kind of come in. Um, you know, all of our um, residential is changing or changing their lobbies and our office is changing their lobbies because everyone's ordering Uber Eats and all these deliveries. And so th the whole world is changing before us as far as mobility, how we get products, how we get services, how do we get to destination. Um, and so we are very much thinking about that. We want to be known for that. I mean, the, the reasons why we're the first city in the country to have drive AI and, and autonomous vehicles on our public streets is we want to be known for that. Um, the reasons why that we want to be the first city in the, in the world to have Uber Elevate is we're starting to make a mark for ourselves as being innovators in transportation and technology. And so now all these companies are coming to us saying, okay, I've got these artificial intelligent stoplights that I want you to test out. Are you willing to do it? And they know Frisco is willing to do it. Um, and so we're starting to roll those out where, you know, our stoplights will ar already talk to some cars, but in the future they'll talk to more cars, you know, where you'll know that in five seconds that light's about to turn green. Or if you're driving down Preston Road, don't drive 47 miles an hour because you're going to hit that, those red lights. Your car knows if you drive 43 miles an hour, you're going to go right through every single green light. Um, so those, those are things that you know, we're, we're thinking about every single day to the point that we actually, one of our key staffers, we put him in the position of being essentially our chief innovation officer for all things mobility. Um, and he's getting so much attention across the state that he was actually just put on Governor Perry's panel to how to figure this out statewide. Um, so that's how we're going to solve our traffic in, in the future. It's definitely not going to be moving people with, um, with buses. Yeah, so Uber Elevate is, is flying drones. Um, the, you can actually see the, the first helipad um, out at Frisco Station right now. There's a big windsock that's out there next to it. So it's going to start by testing helicopters to start identifying the flight patterns. And then they will be um, drones. Um, and they'll be um, um, in our air that with the helicopters this year, um, the drones within the next couple of years. Um, and then it will be a commercially vi um, viable service. And the business model is essentially, um, you could get on one of these at Frisco Station, you could be dropped off literally at your terminal at the airport in seven minutes. And the cost is essentially what you'd pay for an Uber Black. Um, and so just think about how that would change how you lived in the city if these were all over town. That if you wanted to go to a Cowboys game, and oh my gosh, it's gonna take me you know, two hours to drive down there, find a parking spot, walk to the stadium, or I can jump in one of these and I could be at my gate to enter the stadium in six minutes, you know. Um, or I can be at American Airlines for a concert, you know, in, in seven minutes, dropped off right there, not even have to pay for parking. Um, and so you're going to see these all over DFW. I um, mean, it's going to be a way that people, um, you know, get around. I know it's, it's hard to believe, but it's, it's coming. You know, I was in the, uh, I did the first ceremonial test ride for Drive AI, and it was a big deal. That, I mean, the Wall Street Journal sent people out, you know, I mean, we had people from across the country that were covering it because it was the first time it had ever happened. And I was really nervous about it. Um, we had a helicopter f following us, <laughs> filming us, and I was just thinking in my mind, I was like, oh, please God, don't let anything go wrong. Um, and sure enough, I mean, we pulled out of Hall Park, we made our first left, and someone ran out in front of the car and we like all just gasped in the, in the car and of course it did everything it was supposed to do it stopped and you know then we talked about uh, they, they were asking later did you stage that I'm like no I did not stage someone running in front of the car um, um, but uh, we didn't know if we'd be able to stop if we were actually driving ourselves I mean it was that close and then I get asked if um, if I'll do the first uber elevate ride um, and I pause a little bit on that one, but um, um, I'm like, heck yeah, I'll do that, you know. So, um, but yeah, that's uh, that's going to be a really cool one. That's going to put Frisco on an international stage when that starts going live. 
Okay, we have exactly 10 minutes for questions left, so I'm going to try to get through as many as we can here. Bob Clark asks, what are the plans for downtown Frisco and traffic patterns there? So uh, Main Street is under design right now. Um, so we had to make a strategic decision about town, downtown, whether we wanted Main Street to be focused on the pedestrian or the automobile. Um, and it's actually something that I campaigned really hard on that I firmly believe it had to be focused on the pedestrian if we wanted our downtown to be successful. Um, and so essentially what we're going to do is we're changing, um, redoing Elm Street, which runs behind there, changing the uh, stop sign orientation. So that will actually become a second thoroughfare. So you'll start seeing um, um, businesses pop up along Elm Street as well. Um, Main Street, um, the center median will be taken out. Um, the sidewalks are going to be brought out. Um, so it's going to be much more walkable. There's going to be patios kind of on Main Street. You're going to feel that activity. Um, we're going to bring in the pedestrian crossing. If you've ever tried to actually cross Main Street, it's um, like playing Frogger uh, a little bit. Um, and so that's going to be brought in so it feels very comfortable to walk across from one side to the other. Fourth Street is going to be closed and main an event plaza. Um, and then the alleys that run behind, like where Summer Moon is, you're already starting to see it naturally happen where they have the cornhole out there, but those are going to be closed down and become another pedestrian walkway. Um, so, you know, we spent a lot of money on this downtown master plan. We're spending a ton of money to do this project. But, you know, for the longest time we were frustrated with downtown because, you know, we didn't know as a city how to help. It almost had to start happening organically and naturally, and that's what's happening. And it started taking on an identity. And now we saw an opportunity to say, okay, here's how we can pour gas on that fire. And you're going to really start seeing downtown Frisco take off. And it's going to start building out multiple blocks. And um, so I'm, I'm very bullish on downtown Frisco right now. All right. Good news. Okay, the next question is about what population do you think Frisco is going to max out at? We're going to hit 200,000 this year. Um, you know, I mean, at one point, um, you know, Scott will remember this, that, you know, we were at a work session five years ago and staff kind of just dropped a bomb on us and said, you know, based on our current projections and building plans, we're, we're going to be um, you know, well over 400,000 people. And we almost fell out of our chairs, you know. And so, uh, you know, a big part of that is, you know, we've been kind of down zoning and, and trying to reduce those counts, you know, quite a bit. We'll probably be closer, you know, um, 300,000 to, you know, 320, depending on how some of these build out. But a lot of that was very strategic to try to reduce, reduce those numbers, so. Okay. Next up, how does Frisco recruit businesses to open here or move here, and do we want and need more businesses to move here? Yes. We are open for business. So, of course, we've got Rick and some other EDC people here as well. Um, they are just absolutely killing it, our economic development team right now. Um, again, we brought Ron Patterson in as new president there, changed focus, got rid of the noise, um, really started being aggressive, attracting these jobs. Um, the pipeline of potential companies, I mean, why we were at City Council last night to, to over, you know, past 11 o'clock is we were hearing about all the potential projects that we're bidding on and maybe announced here in 2020. Um, multiple Fortune 100 companies um, that have shortlisted Frisco. Um, so there's a lot of excitement um, about those opportunities that come here. I mean, we want jobs here in our community. Um, obviously, it creates a tax base for our community. It creates, you know, obviously jobs for people to work here. Um, and so that is um, very, very, you know, important for us. Okay, so the next question uh, asks about um, addressing demands for services and homelessness. I think we've kind of talked through that one, so uh, let's go on to the next question. LSU Tigers, Ashley, where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> All right, she says, with the LSU Tigers being the number one team in the nation, <clears throat> will you proudly support them as the proud mayor of... Sports City USA. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I am rooting for LSU. Yes, and that is that is legitimate. Just because um, I'm kind of tired of Alabama winning it every year. Sorry, there I know go. we got some Alabama fans um, here, but you've you've had your run. <laughs> Technically, that a question was anonymous, but you know. Okay, the next question is, in our neighborhoods, people park on both sides of the street clogging the way. Can the city pass an ordinance against it? They are impassable for emergencies. Um, good, good question. Um, the, I mean, they are public streets. Um, th that's something I'd have to... 
kind of have to think about, um, you know, which side of the street gets protected, which doesn't, you know, then your neighbor, you know, can't park on his side of the street, so he parks on your side of the street in front of your house. Um, how would that go over? I'm just kind of brainstorming here. What do y'all think? Y'all like this ordinance or not? Um, no. I think that was voted by, by popularity there. Fair enough. Um, but, I mean, those are some of the, I mean, that's an interesting concept. Um, I mean, part of it is it must be, I would think that's probably an older road, whoever mentioned that, because um, our street widths used to be narrower, so that may be the case. But whoever asked that, get with me after, and we'll chat about it. Fair enough. All right, Bob Clark asked, small business, uh, regarding small businesses, it's one thing to compete with corporate giants. It's another to compete with small businesses what is your advice for a long-time small business? Wow, okay. Um, you know, I mean, I've been a big believer in, in our businesses. Um, it's, it starts with, you know, the people you surround yourself with. Um, that starts with, you know, the people that you hire and you work with every day. Um, I know my team's here supporting me. So Cheney Group, let's be loud and proud. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's a big part of it, setting a culture and identity, um, which, you know, we've done and, um, over the years and scraped our knees. Um, but we've also believed as a small business, there is no better way to grow your business than being fully ingrained in the community that you're trying to serve. Um, and so we have been doing that for the 20 years that we've been doing it. All the small businesses that I see every single day and that are here today clearly do that and believe that same thing which is you know it's about developing relationships it's about knowing people it's about supporting other businesses and you know even if that's not going to help you today it always finds its way back to you in some capacity um, you know being active in groups like the Frisco Chamber and other you know groups and finding things that you're passionate about you know and then just you know you're naturally being around people that share those same passions you know and there's all those kinds of opportunities here in Frisco. I mean, not every small business is going to be successful, and I know, you know, Tony could spit out the numbers as far as, um, I'll put Tony on the spot. I mean, what's the success rate of a small business? I mean, it's pretty low. Um, but I can tell you the ones that are doing these types of things are going to be a lot higher um, um, th than that. So, you know, I mean, that would be, uh, I guess, the best piece of advice I would give. Okay. Next question. Plano has attracted many large enterprises. What is Frisco doing to try to attract corporations? I love this question. So um, this was actually really eye-opening for me because, you know, as a council member, you know, I was really, really frustrated by Plano spiking the ball in the end zone in our face over and over and over again. Um, and the response was always, well, they have Legacy West, you know, their decision maker is never going to get fired if, if at the end of the day you picked Plano over Frisco, and it was the same story over and over again. And so, you know, r literally the first month after I was elected, I, you know, I went and met with the Hillwoods of the world and, you know, anyone who would do business in Frisco, and I just wanted the feedback. Um, and it was really, really eye-opening to me because the feedback I constantly got was, the market does not perceive Frisco to be serious about jobs. That Frisco only wants to be a sports and entertainment town. Um, and that was really hard to hear, but it was also why companies weren't coming here. And so uh, um, it's kind of a funny story. So everyone kind of remembers the hokey Amazon pitch we did. I'm sure many of you all saw that. That was actually a very strategic response to that feedback. We were brainstorming as a team saying, how do we change the message um, that Frisco is open for business and that we want to be serious about jobs? Um, and that was just kind of a light bulb moment where we were like, okay, let's get out first on this Amazon thing and we're gonna use this to see if we can change that message. And so we put out that little hokey video. I mean, we literally, we wanted to be the first, so like the next day we filmed it. We had no idea what we were doing. And Dana Bear and her team were like, let's make it as hokey as we possibly can make it. And it worked. I mean, the thing went viral. We ended up getting, they calculate, $6 million worth of media value from that video. Um, I was, uh, I have been told, and I believe it, that I was the most interviewed mayor in, f in America about Amazon. 
and part of the reason was is we were like the little engine that could. You know, it was just a fun story. So I did CNN interview. I mean, I was doing two, three, four interviews every single day. And all I was doing was selling that Frisco was open for business. I mean, yeah, we would have loved Amazon to pick Frisco, and they made a mistake that they didn't. Um, but um, we have opportunities for companies like that. And the message has changed. And it's, you know, between us just putting our flag in the ground, saying we're going to be serious. It's about hiring the right person to lead our EDC ch um, team. It's about putting the right people in those board positions to make those decisions. Um, and it was about being very aggressive. I mean, we heard in the market just a few weeks ago of um, a brand name. Um, there was rumors going on that they may be in the market for a relocation. And so in the past, we probably would have said, well, we hope they call us. And instead, our team went and did research and started finding the person we need to talk to. And we went up and we sat in my office and we called, cold called over and over and over until he picked up the phone. And I had a conversation with him and he basically said, how did you hear about this? How did you know about it? And I said, I can't reveal my sources. Um, <laughs> but was very standoffish, you know, and just wanted to get off the phone with me. And we kept talking, kept talking, and then all of a sudden he started asking questions. About, oh, Frisco's next to Plano? Oh, tell me about that, tell me about your demographics. It ended up being almost a 30 minute call with a C-suite person at a Fortune 100 company. Um, and those are the different types of things that our team is doing about, you know, being aggressive. And so that's why we were super excited. I, some of y'all probably saw like two to three weeks ago, we went from that, from the perception of Frisco not being serious about jobs, to two to three weeks ago we were named um, the fastest growing city in America for job growth. It's quite a transformation. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I'm afraid we are running up against our time. Do you have any closing thoughts or thing, anything you want to finish off on? Oh, that was a piece of cake. I was expecting some, <laughs> some tough ones. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, Ren Ovard would kill me if I did not mention one month from today is the Frisco Bowl, sponsored by <laughs> Tropical Smoothie Cafe, um, located on El Dorado. Um, but no, please support the game. Um, tickets are available. You can see Ren if you want to be a um, supporter of your company. Um, it's something that um, is a great economic engine for our city. There are two games in Frisco. That's confusion. So we have the Frisco Bowl, which is a Division One game. And then we have the FCS Championship that North Dakota State wins every year. <laughs> that comes in January. Um, so support both. It's impossible to get tickets to the North Dakota State game. So make sure you support the Frisco Bowl because we want to make sure they stay here and renew their contracts every year. And Ren, of course, has been doing a great job you know, with them helping their brand. Is that a good enough plug for you? Should I keep going? <laughs> uh, no, but thank you all um, you know, for, for listening to me and for sharing your questions. And um, I hope you feel that you know, I'm open to your concerns. I know there's probably people here that wanted to ask me things or give me feedback and didn't want to do it publicly. So please, you know, come see me, come talk to me, call me, text me, email me, all those things um, with your questions and, and concerns. Um, we still know that we have a lot of work to do um, and we can't do it without your input. So thank you. Thank you guys. Another hand for Jeff. <laughs> Mayor Cheney. Sorry we did not get to all of your questions, but we're going to, uh, we'll catalog all those questions and uh, Maybe I'll get some time with Jeff. We can bring him on a podcast and try to get some answers to some of those other things we didn't get around to in the near future. Until then, thank you guys for coming out today. And uh, I think we're done. Wendy, do you have any final words? Nope. That's it, guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys coming out today.